Welcome to week three. This week we're going to talk about characteristics of vulnerable populations. The learning outcomes are as follows. To be able to describe characteristics of vulnerable populations. To describe the risk factors that lead to inadequate health care and poor health outcomes within the U.S. To discuss the concepts of social justice as they relate to vulnerable groups. Within the U.S., what do you think are some of the risk factors that can lead to inadequate health care and poor health outcomes? Think about populations that you've seen in your area of practice, whether it's in the acute care setting or in the community, long-term care settings or in the schools. Do you see race and ethnicity as a risk factor? How about socioeconomic status or health insurance coverage? If we take a look at different factors, we can see that there is actually a very difficult cycle to break. We know that risk factors influence healthcare access and quality of healthcare. This model demonstrates the linkage between minority race, ethnicity, low socioeconomic status, and health insurance coverage. If we look at the top, you'll see that racial and ethnic minorities experience greater barriers to obtaining higher education. And then that lack of education leads to employment in lower wage jobs. The lower wage jobs are less likely to offer health insurance. The lack of health insurance reduces access to health care services. And then without adequate access to care, health problems go untreated. We know that untreated problems create even more barriers to education and employment opportunities. Over the course of the last decade, the former U.S. Surgeon General worked to, to place the elimination of racial and ethnic disparities at the top of the nation's health agenda. Minority race and ethnicity have been shown to predict poorer health status, poorer access to care, and poorer quality of care. The traditional use of the word minority is quickly becoming inapplicable in the United States. The projections of the population growth by race and ethnicity will reshape the demographic picture of the United States. By 2050, Minorities combined will create the majority, yielding what we call a majority minority. And you'll see that demonstrated here. Risk factors influence healthcare access and the quality of healthcare. The model demonstrates the linkage between minority race and ethnicity, low socioeconomic status, and healthcare coverage. So you'll see in 2010, the majority of the population was white, not Hispanic. But the population will be shifting. The, projectin, the projection by 2050 is that there will no longer be a majority, which is your 50 or 51 percent. Instead, the prediction is 46 percent white, not Hispanic, and then 30% Hispanic, together, both of these will make up the majority. One theory behind racial and ethnic differences in healthcare experiences is that they are attributable to differences in socioeconomic status. The poverty thresholds are important because they are used by government agencies as eligibility criteria for, for particular assistance programs. There are many programs that use these poverty thresholds, such as Head Start Centers, which are services for children with disabilities, food stamp programs, the National Food, I'm sorry, the National School Lunch Program, Energy Assistance Programs, and Medicaid and CHIP, just to name a few. So here's an example of the poverty threshold. You can access it through FamiliesUS.org Product Federal Dash Poverty Guidelines. 
So the Federal Poverty Guidelines for 2016 are listed here, and they are what determine eligibility for Medicaid and CHIP. So 100% of the poverty threshold is $11,880 for one single individual. Can you imagine trying to survive on $11,880? If you have a family of four, that threshold is 24,300. Different markets use different percentages of the poverty threshold to determine the eligibility. That's why there are multiple percentages listed across this row. So what else do we know about socioeconomic status? We know that individuals with the greatest financial resources have the greatest ability to access health services and also to obtain the highest quality care. Income translates into purchasing power for health care services and income also becomes a part of a larger concept of social position generally referred to as the socioeconomic status of a person. We know that the socioeconomic status has a significant impact on health. Therefore, it's important to understand the factors that influence socioeconomic status. Can you think of some? The environment and the place of your residence can influence all three measures of an individual's socioeconomic status. So if we define socioeconomic status as income, education, and occupation, Residency certainly can influence your socioeconomic status. If you consider where someone lives and they live in an area where all the other residents are also from a low socioeconomic status, the opportunity for higher paying jobs may not exist. Think of other rationales for how environment and place of residence can influence your socioeconomic status, what your income is, how about your education. In the U.S., your place of residence dictates which public school students can attend. So for example, in the school district of Lancaster, students go to different elementary schools based on where they live. In Lancaster County, your school district is based on the location where you live. In areas of concentrated poverty where financial resources are limited, public schools have lower average test scores, more restricted curriculum, and higher dropout rates than public schools in middle class neighborhoods. So you can see how a place of residence may dictate your socioeconomic status. Residence also dictate, I'm sorry, residence also dictates employment opportunities. So is there access to convenience and well-paying entry-level jobs where you live? School vouchers are meant to address this issue. School vouchers have been a topic over the last five to ten years and you can Search for more information about school vouchers here on the National Education Association's webpage. What school vouchers do is that they allow an individual who lives in an area where there's a poor performing school to use a voucher to attend a school in a different area. So the National Education Association actually opposes school vouchers because they say it diverts essential resources from public schools to private schools. What do you think? Income and education are strongly correlated. More highly educated individuals generally, not always, but generally earn higher wages. Like income, educational attainment is unequally distributed across demographic groups. Similar disparities in educational attainment also exist according to gender. Occupation is closely tied to income and education. In general, higher education is associated with the ability to obtain higher level occupations and, of course, 
with resulting higher salaries and typically greater benefits. Just as with income and education, there are also differences in unemployment rates across demographic groups. We also know that low-income jobs rarely provide the much-needed health insurance. Private insurance fees are too costly for the already struggling low-income families. Consider these characteristics of vulnerability as you watch the next video discussing social justice in healthcare.